before we kick it to Brian, just want to say, if this is your first time here, we're excited that you're here. We're going to gather Wednesday nights, eight to nine o'clock. And we just want to be a community that's, you know, again, striving to know God and, and help others to know the same. We want this to be an encouraging time to you. It's going to be something, um, you know, different speakers each week. And you're going to be hearing from your peers. We're going to be doing once a month. Uh, your peers are going to be leading. And so if this is your first time, we're going to drop some links into the chat. And uh, the three links are the first time guests. If you could just fill that out. Uh, also a link to the group meet and then a link to prayer. And so we gather as a staff every Thursday from one to three. And the first thing we do is lift up your prayer requests. Uh, it's a privilege to, and an honor to pray for you. So it could be anything and everything. And we know that each and every one of you is dealing with something. Um, and it doesn't matter, you know, if it's big or small to you, it's, it's, it matters to God. So if you want prayer for anything, or if you know someone who wants prayer, you know, we're happy to, to lift it up. And uh, th that prayer link is completely anonymous unless you don't want it to be. And so you could fill that out and not worry about me or Adam, Hope, Don, Bobby, Mike, Kim, knowing something about you specifically that you don't want us to, but we can still go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, so tonight, we are privileged to have Brian Kelly with us. Brian is uh, an alum of UNC, graduated in 91, I think. Brian, is that right? Yep, 91. 91. Uh, played lacrosse here, was a national champion, went on uh, to, now currently came on to be the coach at Calvert Hall High School in Baltimore, Maryland, and has... Uh, been there since 1996, and uh, I kind of titled, you know, our time together, Leveraging Your Life, because, you know, this is something I feel like Brian has really done, uh, leverage his life for Jesus Christ. Anything and everything he does has a purpose to it, uh, whether it be coaching, whether it be, uh, you know, just loving others, you know. So I'm on staff with FCA. And I met Brian back in 2006 and FCA for the majority of its life since 1954 has been a ministry that's focused on high school athletes and uh, we have huddles. And at that time, Jacob, who's on this call and, and his younger brothers were, you know, I think Jacob, you were six when I first met you, but you know, a few years later, Brian's like, well, can we do this for like my kids? Can we do a huddle for my kids? And so they started a huddle at his house called JFCA and just was always using every relationship he had and tried to leverage it for you know, people to grow in their relationship with Jesus and also does that with his team. Um, and I'm, I'm going to shut up. I don't want to take any thunder from him, but we're going to be able to hear from him, his story. Um, we're going to have time for some Q&A at the end. And, and I just think it's, it's an awesome story because it's probably a lot similar to yours. Um, and maybe your faith journey, and then also your athletic career. So go ahead and, and welcome Brian Kelly. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and mute myself. And the floor is yours, Brian. Thanks, Scott. Um, it's good to be here with everyone. Um, first of all, I have a lot of respect for each and every one of you just to take the time to, to be on a Zoom um, and to really um, hear someone like myself speak or just to be together in community. Um, I would think one of the biggest things that I see the biggest pain that for that I see through COVID is the isolation and that we're built for community and we're built to be we, not I, and all this stuff. And uh, it's hard. And I, I can't imagine and just you knowing having a son who's at UNC and understanding what each and every student athlete is going through to participate in their sport and to do the things that they are doing just regular kids and just being a high school coach, seeing what I have to see with these high school kids, it's really hard. And um, I think it's really important that as much as you can to have these opportunities, but it's never the same than it is when you're in person with somebody. Um, just a little bit about myself. I'm the youngest of four boys. Um, I grew up in a, uh, a faith-based home, um, very Catholic, but it started as a Catholic home. Um, uh, my mom and dad were Catholic and they grew us up in, in the faith. Um, and uh, really, I had a good head knowledge of what it meant to, uh, of who Jesus was and what God was, but it wasn't heart knowledge yet for me at that time growing up. 
But growing up, I grew up in a great family. My parents are awesome people, um, generous people, kind people, loving people, and godly people. I mean, they instilled that faith into us where my dad would pray with us before every game. And just, I'd wake up seeing my dad read this Bible. And, you know, it's interesting. My dad met Christ through AA. He was an, he was a, an alcoholic. Um, and he, through AA, learned that there was, you know, he needed to surrender things to a higher power. And that's how he started growing in his faith. And, um, and my parents started growing in their faith when I was really younger um, and kind of instilled that to us. And so when I was a, young, a little kid, they took us to a Billy Graham crusade at Memorial Stadium. And uh, I was all fired up because, um, you know, not to hear Billy Graham, but I heard there was like an altar call and that I would be able to go out on the field and touch the grass. Like I really just wanted to touch Memorial Stadium grass. It's where the Orioles played. So when I heard the altar call, I think that was probably more of my motive as a 12 year old was to touch the grass and to really to accept Jesus in my heart. But I did accept him in my heart. I know I accepted him truthfully in my heart at that time. Um, but growing up in, in a, an all boys home and, and um, it was a lot of fun. Uh, I definitely got beat up a lot. Um, I idolized my brothers. Um, I wanted to be like my brothers. Um, and uh, it was a house that was filled with a lot of sports and activity, but we were also very much in the world as, as, as kids throughout high school and just growing up as we got into it. Um, you know, I, I was always being the youngest. I'm an, evidently, a, I'm a people pleaser. So I always was just acquiesced to do whatever I could to help the family help out, whatever. And my brothers would do that thing to me like, hey, man, if you want to be my favorite brother, go get my shoes. And I'd run and get their shoes because I thought I was that dumb to get their, you know, to, to earn their, their love, I guess, or their respect. And so um, as I was growing up, I just watched and I watched my older brothers live and I wanted to be like my older brothers. And so when they were in high school, they were out partying, mom and dad were away, everybody would come over our house and the festivities began. And so I was that little sixth and seventh grader looking at them and, you know, doing they, every now and then they'd give me a, a beer at eighth grade and, you know, it'd be like doing my just way too early in life. But I started kind of growing through that and just, just seeing that as a, as a kid. But also as I went through, um, I just watched my brothers, more importantly, athletically, their success and what they did. And so I grew up playing football and lacrosse. And um, I followed my brother Frank's footsteps, who was the oldest, who went to a high school called Calvert Hall. And I, I went to Calvert Hall. And uh, I was a, a you know, good athlete. Um, I really, when I went to high school, I think my identity was who I was as an athlete. I gained all my significance was based off of how I performed and it was my, it was who I was. And so I thought I was even a little bit more significant than I should have been because I was pretty good. And uh, it was my God. It was, it was definitely my God. And, um, but I still had a heart for God. Like I knew God, I wanted to love God, but I didn't want him to control my life at all. Cause I thought he was going to wreck it. And, and ruin it. You know, I didn't understand who God truly was. I didn't understand who the nature who God truly was. Um, so I was involved in FCA a little bit more because when my brother Frank, the oldest, went to Cornell, he came back on fire for Christ. I mean, on fire, like feeding us with a fire hose, man. It was like a turnoff more than anything else. He would come in and tell us about Jesus and what he's done in his life. And it was great. It was like, you know, it's my turn now, Frank. I'm in high school. Let me do my thing. And he was like, oh, you know, just trying to, it, it was, in, he was a very intense guy. And so um, as I got involved, he started coaching my high school and started teaching me stuff. And it was, so I went to FCA as a senior, totally out of guilt because my brother was starting this FCA ministry. And I went because, you know, I had to support my brother. And so, um, uh, but I didn't go because it was like, I was embarrassed. I was worried about what everybody would think if Brian Kelly's, you know, going to FCA. And I knew I wanted to be there because I had a heart for God, you know, and I always knew that God loved me. And I always would pursue and pray to him and seek him in different ways. But I was so concerned about what everybody else thought of me um, and what I did. I think even when I drank when I would go out and party, I did it so I would be considered cool. 
you know, it was, that is what my identity was. It was to be accepted and to be cool. I was a very insecure person deep down. Um, I didn't realize it at the time. So um, fast forward to college, uh, I ended up having opportunities to go to a lot of different schools. And I, I fortunately was able to go to the University of North Carolina. Um, I was that guy that did really well in school, but I tested terribly. I worked really hard. Um, I had it academically because school was not easy for me. Um, as I got here to UNC, um, you know, I was this big time player in my mind and my recruiting wise, and I ended up going there to play. And um, I, I came in with a, a little bit of a back injury. I had two herniated discs that I occurred in high school and I started coming in and I played with it in high school. I'm like, I can play with it here. I'll be fine. And I was doing the physical therapy thing. And um, as I was going through uh, the whole lacrosse side of it, um, my mom, who is a strong Christian woman, just kept telling me, she's like, Brian, you got to get involved in a Bible study while you're there. You just got to go. And I was like, all right, I'll go. And so I heard about Campus Crusade for Christ. And I went to my first Campus Crusade for Christ. And I'm this guy from Baltimore and I walk in and everyone's like, had the main name tag on and I was there by myself and everyone's like, you know, Hey Brian, how you doing Brian? And everybody was so nice with the Southern accent and it totally like freaked me out. Like it turned me off. I was like, I can't, like no one can be this nice. Like this is impossible for people to be this nice, but they were that nice. And I just, I never went back. I was like, I can't go back. I, I just, it was just, it freaked me out. It was just where I was. It wasn't them. It was me. Um, and I, I, everything I did in that, it was kind of like uh, secretive a little bit of why I did it. I just didn't want to, um, I don't know. But as I go into that freshman year, um, you know, lacrosse wise, I started out my freshman fall and I was playing really well. And I was starting as a freshman and uh, I had great experience with it. And I was all excited. Everything was good. Um, fast forward to the spring. I'll never forget. I'm walking out to my first practice my freshman year. And um, it was on going to Navy Field. And um, my defensive coordinator at the time, who eventually became my head coach as a senior, said to me as I walked out, said, hey, Kelly, you effing suck and you will never effing play here and I was like what and I was just starting the whole spring that was his comment to me and he just walked away and I'll never forget Kevin Halls was behind me who was the senior captain he said you got to blow him off he's just trying to get in your head Brian he's just trying to get in your head I'm like what and that moment changed the whole trajectory of my seat, my freshman year, I was done. I never had someone say that because um, it was in my head so much. And I, I was always trying to seek the approval of a coach and approval of, 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 you know, man, and trying to get that as I, it was like an idol to me in a sense that I had to get that approval. And I went out that year and I, I didn't, I, I played okay, but I had to get over it. And fortunately God brought some people like Kevin Hawes to help me understand that's how he is. He's just trying to play a head game with you or whatever. But I allowed it to control my thoughts and it, it, it kind of rocked my confidence a little bit. Well, as the season went on, my back was getting worse and um, I ended up playing a good amount. I played some man down. I never started any games. Then I move into my sophomore year and as a sophomore, um, uh, I, I really, um, they, the coaches told me I was too little and I had to gain weight. And so I started trying to gain weight the wrong way by drinking and eating. And, you know, I'd still work out, but I was like overweight and I was playing at 185 and I'm not, I'm 5'11". I wasn't a 185, 190 kid. I was a 165, 175 kid. End up going into the season. I'm having a good year, getting ready to go into um, a Syracuse game. And, um, but I was depressed, man. I was totally depressed. After my freshman year, I wanted to leave. I didn't want to stay in North Carolina at all. I hated it. Um, I, I didn't like any of it because um, my identity was kind of rocked. I was that big, I was the little fish in the big pond. And um, 
it wasn't giving me life. Uh, lacrosse wasn't giving me life. I, I really even didn't even like it that much anymore. And I fast forward to my sophomore year. Um, we're getting ready to play Syracuse. It's a pregame. And I was really working my way up. And I think I was about to start in that game. And I was covering a kid. And we went back and forth. And I slipped and fell. And my ankle hit my hip, you know. So I literally was laying on the turf. And I'm like, it's over. I thought I tore my ACL. I'm like, it's done. And the first thing that came to my mind was like, oh, my God, I got an excuse to quit. I got a reason to quit because this is not going the way that I want it to go. And um, so I could say I blew my knee out. I could say I could, I, I quit because I wasn't living up to the, the expectations of everything, being this top recruit and all this stuff and so, with my identity. Um, so I didn't tip blow out my ACL. I, I did a high ankle sprain. I tore my interosseous membrane in my ankle and it just took all this time to get back. And on top of it was with my back, the injury was really due to the fact of, of my back. So um, I come home, uh, then th th that spring, I started getting involved in a Bible study with my brother, David, who was a senior on the team. And it was interesting how God met all of us at the same time, like right between our sophomore and junior year. And my brother, David, really started growing in his faith and he had a Bible study and I went a little bit, but I was still living on both sides of the fence, man. I was living on the double uh, world and uh, it's not a great place to be. Um, then fast forward that summer, you know, I was really wanting to change. I was trying to change my life. I wanted to, to be this godly man. I wanted to stop drinking. I wanted to stop cursing. I wanted to stop doing all the things that I knew that weren't of God. And, but I just couldn't, I, I couldn't stop. I couldn't change. And um, went to a Bible study and I did all these things. And my mom, I'll never forget, um, I was in the kitchen and I went to my mom and I, she was asking me some questions. And I just said, you know, mom, I'm trying to live this godly life. I'm trying to pursue Christ. I'm trying to do the right things. I'm trying to be good. I'm trying to be this. I'm trying to be that. And I'm miserable. I can't, I can't do it. And it, she said, Brian, you don't have to change. God will change you. Just pursue him. All you have to do is pursue him and he will change you at the right time. And that was a game changer for me. I was, never heard that. Like, I thought I had to be all these things. And I went up to my bedroom that night, got on my knees right after the conversation and just asked God, I recommitted my life to Christ. And I said, Lord, I can't do this in my own power. I have to surrender it. And in a weird way, it was like surrendering to women. And I laid my life down to him and just said, I'm just going to be faithful and pursue you, and then you can change me. And uh, ironically, that summer, I had to get back surgery. Um, that has been prolonged. I had um, a sciatic nerve pain all the way down my leg, two um, herniated discs and so forth. And I was faced with a situation there where um, at that time, you had a you know, huge scar where I might not play again. And so I literally went in with the mindset that this is, I might play and I might not. And I was like, Lord, I trust you. If you don't want me to play this game again, I know you're going to give me something different. And uh, that, you know, in my life for a purpose. Right. And he ended up fortunately giving me lacrosse back um, and allowed me to continue to play. But that summer, as I was leading into that, I got involved in a Bible study with a guy named Mike Donahue who is good friends with Pat Goodman, who you're going to hear next week. He's awesome, by the way. And I started getting I'll study with some friends and I just was there learning, being challenged, wasn't worried about trying to change. Um, as a coach, I have a saying for all my players, be who God created you to be. Don't be anything else, but be who God created you to be. I felt like I had to not be who God created me to be. I thought I had to be somebody different. And then I realized I just had to be who I was and that God would use me at that time. So as I got involved in that, I ended up going back to school and there was a girl tennis player named Gigi Neely and the quarterback, uh, a, um, a guy named Mark May. Mark May was a former quarterback at UNC and his son, you know, was a great basketball player at UNC. Um, he was played in the pros, but he was back doing something um, and he was, he, my, him, myself, and Gigi got together and said, let's just start a Bible study. 
So we started an athletic Bible study and it was three people. I didn't even know if you said, go to the book of Ephesians. I had no idea where that was in the Bible. I'm like, where, Ephesians, where is that? You know, like I just knew Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Old Testament, New Testament. And that was about it. So Mark was leading it and Mark stuttered a little bit, you know, so we have a stutter. He's leading the Bible study and then he did an awesome job. And then Gigi was the girl and she was great. And I just grew so much and I really was challenged by it. But what really challenged me was this guy named Mike X in camera. Mike heard about the Bible study and X came and to Mark. And I think really Mark probably went to X and said, look, I have this thing, this Bible study, would you lead it? And so Mike had took over the Bible study and really my desires and my God used Mike in such a way in my life where my desires changed, my identity changed. And I really started growing in my faith of who I'm living for before I was living for myself, but in reality, I was living for others. Um, there's a verse Colossians 3 23 whatever you do whether word or deed do as if you're doing for Lord for the Lord not man I was always trying and I still struggle with it to please man I was always trying to get the approval and please the coach and you know as I got through my experience and started realizing like God's given me these gifts God's given me the gift to play God if this is I, I, I got to use my gifts to glorify him and Mike did this lesson that I still utilize with my team today. It's called all, regarding all praise performance and really challenged us to, to understand who God is and, and to thank God for one thing each and every time you play. And I did that challenge where I thank God for the be able to walk one game and then thanked him that I could see that I could run. And it was this, my senior year and I'll, I'll get back to that. But, um, and it gave me a piece of that. I played with freedom and joy. And I started playing for him. And so, um, you know, it wasn't easy either. You know, so my junior year, I ended up starting and things start worked out well for me um, from a playing perspective. But fast forward to my senior year, I want to make sure I honor your guys' time. Um, you know, going in, I, I really had the desire. I wanted to be a captain. I thought I could lead the team, you know, and I really didn't politic for it. But um, you know, everyone knew where I stood for, in my faith on the team and especially the coach. We had a new head coach at the time and um, he was the uh, defensive coordinator, the, the guy who gave me that great form of confidence on my freshman year when I walked on the field. Um, and I loved him. He was a good dude. I, I learned to understand him a little bit. And I kind of learned to blow him off and uh, take what he said seriously and other things. But um, that year, uh, they, they voted for captain and uh, the votes came in and Clarman comes to the team and says, look, we don't know each other well enough. We're going to have another vote. And then I was like, okay. So then he says, I'm going to vote for captain again. The vote for captain again, three weeks later, comes back and says, hey man, we don't know each other well enough. We're going to come back when we get back from break. We get back from break, they vote for captain again. And I wasn't captain. And I was devastated. I was not de devastated. Not, I was really upset. And um, I walked to my car and my assistant, the assistant coach came up to me for some reason and ran up and said, Brian, you were voted captain. But Coach K didn't think you should be captain because you didn't party with the team. So or hang out with the team enough. So he chose to go a different route. And I'm glad he told me that because it gave me to know that my friend, my peers voted for me. But I also was like, okay. The one thing I realized, God doesn't make mistakes and God can use all things for good. In that situation, it was the best thing that ever happened to me that I wasn't captain because I got to stretch with the freshmen and all these freshmen were struggling and they all were talking to me all the time. And they all were saying things to me about struggles. And I invited them all to the Bible study. And they would come to a Bible study. They would come in, um, and do all these things. And after the season, I got involved in FCA. And I'm going to go back to lacrosse, but I'm going to share one story I haven't shared before. I don't think I've ever shared it with anybody. But it's true. Um, 
that there was a freshman on that team named Steve Muir. Steve Muir was number 32. Um, and he went to Bible study with me. And then he ended up going to FCA. Uh, we played in a tournament out in Vail, Team FCA. He would stay in touch with me periodically, I'd see him around now that we're older. And um, about four years ago, he was diagnosed with cancer um, right before the, the national 2016. And um, obviously I was in touch with him and I went to visit him in Washington, DC and he was dying and he was, di he was, he was gonna die. There was no way it was coming back. And he said to me that day on his, in bed when he was, he's like, Brian, I know where I'm going. And I'm like, yeah, you're, you're gonna be in paradise. He's like, yes. He goes, I met Christ because of your experience. Like, at Carolina. I don't want to say I led him to Christ because I didn't. I just was a vessel. But I believe if I was a captain, I would never have had that experience to be with him stretching with him every day. So what man intends for evil, God can use for good. And he gave me that little blessing of that. Um, the thing that I really want to share with you, there's two main things. is like your identity it shouldn't be in your sport. Your sport is what you do. It's not who you are. You are a child of God. Every single one of you is a child of God. You're tr he loves you. He loves you more than anything in the world. And I sit there and I see what you guys all deal with at UNC. And it's a great place. And they're great people. And you're part of your elite level athletes. If you're playing a sport there, you're elite. Um, and everything that you've given, you have is a gift. But you guys have multiplied it through your work you know, and through your efforts and you've made it better. You use your talents and you've multiplied them. I always say Michael Jordan didn't make himself 6'6". Six, six. God made him 6'6". Six, six. You know, he, you know, that's what, but God also gave him the gifts and he worked his way and multiplied those gifts. But God loves you and God loved me, you know, and it, life isn't easy. And as I go through life and I go through this and I see what you all are dealing with, it's not easy to deal with what you're dealing with. And I just want to pray, thank you guys and commend you for what you're doing. But the one thing I will tell you, um, you know, I've had some of those hard nights too. And I think back in 2014, um, I was really in a funk uh, in my life. You know, maybe it was a midlife crisis, maybe, I don't know, but I was depressed. And, um, you know, I was sharing with my wife about it and we were talking and I went away for a two week retreat down in um, Asheville, North Carolina. And I was there for two straight weeks. And um, it was the Christian counseling. It was just the Christian thing of just learning and growing and understanding. And, you know, Mike X and Camper, God used X in my life big time. Because you talk about how I was a guy that never took a class before 9 p.m., 9 a.m., ever. And I, I like to sleep. I still don't love the mornings. You know, I like to sleep. Well, Mike comes up to me my senior year and says, hey, Brian, you want to meet with me every Wednesday at 6 a.m. so I can disciple you? And I was like, yes, I do. Now, if you're not talking about God changing me, and I ended up meeting him every Wednesday morning at 6 a.m., um, for me, that was a big deal. We didn't practice until 3, you know, so... I, I, he changed my heart and I always had that faith of pursuing him. And um, I ended up being a coach because of my experience at North Carolina. I ended up wanting to be a coach because I wanted to be able to impact people for Christ. I wanted to have, it's my ministry, not perfect, not perfect. Um, my son can tell you, he sees me. I'm, I'm not perfect. Um, but this walk is a journey. It's a marathon, not a sprint. And you're going to have highs and you're going to have lows and you're going to have valleys and you're going to have peaks. But I will say this. The one thing that I will tell you is I look back on my life and those valley experiences, they were benchmarks for me. And I use this analogy a lot with my Calvert Hall team and with a lot of people. You know, I had the good fortune of going to the Grand Canyon. And when you go out to the Grand Canyon, you look out to the top of the canyon, everything's dry at the peak. There's no life, it's desert. But when you look in the valley and into the depths of the canyon, that's where water is. 
That's where grass is. That's where foliage is. That's where life is. And some of you guys might be going through this valley experience, especially with where you are in isolation, but you're going to grow and be used through this experience. There's growth happening here. And God's going to use this terrible situation that you're all in for a mighty, mighty work. I know it. I don't like it, but I know it. And I just sit there and my heart breaks for each and every one of you at some level because of this quarantine, non, uh, quarantine stuff. You know, it's just tough. I can't, I can't be, I got to be politically correct. But um, so it's just, you know, because it is real. It is a virus. But I also think you guys need to live too. We need to live at some level and where, where we are with it. But um, the one thing that when I went away on this retreat, and I'll, I'll try to wrap it up. I was, like I said, I was depressed a little bit. I was down, but God I really spoke to me um, because I was still trying to please man in other areas of my life in some levels. And so um, the thing that I will share with you is when I first heard the gospel, when people will say, hey, if you're the only person on this earth, Jesus would die for you. I always was like, ah, I I believe it, but I don't think he would just die for me, maybe for the masses or for a group of us, but just for me, I'm not sure. Um, I would say yes, but I'm not sure. And as I started, and this is, uh, this is in 2014 still, um, I would say publicly, yeah, he would die for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But in my heart, I still struggled and wrestled with that. And it was because I didn't truly understand who God was. I didn't understand the nature of God. I didn't understand that God loved me no matter what. And God is not a God of condemnation. God is a God of love, you know? And as I studied and learned and grew about what the nature of God, he's a protector. He, he loves us. He's our light. He's our compassion. He's our teacher. He's our forgiver. He's our healer. He's our servant. He's all powerful. He's all knowing. He's all these things. The God of the universe that created you. You know, God is the light and there is absolutely no darkness in him. And God can never have a, neg a negative thought about you. He doesn't. And he doesn't about any of us. And the one thing is that I will tell you is that God loves you. And um, when you trust in who he is, not what he necessarily does, because God's a little bit unpredictable and we don't always know what he's going to do, but we always can know who he is. And if you trust in who he is, you know, that you'll you'll have that freedom and peace because I just, just want you to leave one thing is know that he loves you no matter what no matter what no matter what no matter what he loves you and um you know that for me was the best thing that I've learned is that God loved me and um the greatest commandment says love the Lord your God with all your heart mind and soul and love your neighbor as you love yourself well, we all know, love your Lord, your God, with all your heart, mind, and soul. The other part says, love your neighbor as you love yourself. I didn't love myself, so I really couldn't love my neighbor. And then when I understand that God loved me, I could love myself and understand that I'm worthy of being loved. And I do love myself. And being able to be able to know that God loves me has allowed me to love others better. And, um, you know, don't listen to the enemy because the devil, he attacks your mind. He tries to tell you you're not good enough, tries to tell you you're not smart enough, tries to tell you you're not pretty enough, tries to tell you, like, don't go there, man. They're not going to like you. Don't, don't do that. What are you doing? Don't do that. That's where he goes. He goes through your mind. And you know what he wants to do? He wants to keep you in isolation. That's what he wants to do. And that's the thing that angers me. And he wants you to have a relationship with a living, loving God, just a relationship with each and every one of you guys here. And, you know, don't let him rob you and tell you lies that you're not good enough, you're not smart enough, you're not worthy enough, you don't deserve to be loved. You do deserve to be loved and you are loved. And that's the biggest thing that challenges athletes today. It's the mind. It's not your ability. It's your mind. You know, and you need to be focused on processes and, and not worry about the outcome and just focus on who God is. Because if you focus on who God is, you'll understand who he is. And if you understand who he is, you know, he has you and he has you and that he loves you. So um, I just want to thank you. And, um, you know, if anyone has, you might have some questions. If you have any questions, please share. Go ahead.
Yeah, before we go into questions, I just want to thank you for being with us, for sharing with us. Um, and one of the reasons why I wanted to invite Brian to, to be with us tonight is he, he kind of knows what you guys are going through. You know, he has a son here at Carolina. He has a son at Maryland. He's a high school coach. So he is a, a coach to 60, 70 guys who are going through what you all are going through. And you know, to hear a message from him kind of identifies with what we're all doing and, and going through. And, and I love how he talked, uh, you know, just that what his mom said to him and what made him go up and, and just sur surrender his life to, to God was uh, pursue God and he'll change you. And, and, and Brian put his life, his faith and trust in Jesus Christ, um, you know, at a young age, and then again, rededicated himself to, to that, uh, that trust. Uh, and what, what does it mean to, to put your faith and, and trust in Jesus Christ? First, we need to know who God is, you know, God, God loved us. God created us. Uh, we also need to understand who we are. Uh, we, we broke that trust. And when we did, you know, sin entered into the world and that created a separation between us and God that we couldn't, um, we couldn't overcome. And the only way that we were able to overcome that was when God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for us. Uh, Jesus lived the life that we could not live and died the death that we deserved. Uh, and then, you know, we're left with the question, well, what do we want to do with that? You know, first, do we believe that? And if we do, we have two choices. One, we could just kind of continue our life the way that we've lived it, or we can honor him and, and put him at the center of our life and try to, to honor him with everything he's given us and everything we do. And uh, you know, I, that was a decision, you know, Brian made and made again in college. And then, you know, in 2014, you know, also still understanding who God was and, and how much he loved him. And, uh, you know, all throughout, Brian may disagree with me, but all throughout Brian's life, like he's looked at opportunities to, to love God and to, to leverage what God has given him to do the same. And that's kind of what we're called to do. You know, God's, God's given us each unique talents, gifts, and, uh, you know, what, what are we going to do with them? And there's, you know, it's important to know one thing about God and Brian said it, there's nothing we can do that's going to make him love us more. And more importantly, there's nothing we can do that's going to make him love us less. And oftentimes we feel like we can only go to God when we got all of our stuff together. And that's, that's a lie. That, that's something that the devil wants you to believe because you're never going to have it all together and you're never going to go to God if that's the case. So um, I wanted to go ahead and, and open it up for some questions for you. Maybe some things about um, his time at Carolina, you know, his time since Carolina, how God's worked in his life, you know, since graduating in 91, what he's doing now, how he coaches and, and makes it a mission field. Uh, you guys have, we have 12 minutes. I uh, just wanted to open it up to you all for some Q and A. You know, there's the one thing I, I want to share with you that's kind of on my heart. Um, uh, and, and I think, the you know, I'm going to talk about COVID and what you guys are dealing with a little bit. Um, and I think what I, why I, I struggle right now, um, I'm angry, to be honest with you. Like, I'm angry. Um, more because as I've been studying, um, and looking God's word in things, um, there's the silent killer of like, everybody's worried about the COVID disease and rightfully so. But what I worry about is your mental health more than this disease, more than anything else. How are you all doing mentally? This is not easy. You know, some people can roll with it and that's fine, but it's gotta be challenging. It's gotta be hard when you can't, like it's hard doing a Zoom call and giving your testimony. You have no idea how the feel is. You know, you can only connect so much and, and we're called to be together. So, you know, I just challenge you, if any of you guys are struggling, don't be afraid not to talk about it with somebody, especially, you know, another Christian friend or somebody. You know, you're seeing like more pastors struggling and failing 
And it's because they're in isolation and other things. They don't have that community, that fellowship. And so, um, you know, I just hope that you guys are doing okay and praying that everybody's doing fine because you can put on this hard exterior, like I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. But there's this inner side of things, it's not easy. And I will tell you, if any one of you is struggling and you want to talk, you can call me. You can get my number. I'll give it out right now. It's 410-371-8227. If anyone has any issues or concerns, anything, questions about just life, athletics, sports, you don't feel comfortable talking about it here, you can call me. Because I can tell you this, I can't do this journey by myself. And I'm 52. You know, none of us can. So we all need each other. Good, Brian. Thank you so much, Brian. Um, something that that your testimony really spoke to me was like the, the seeking approval of man, like just people pleasing. And just my whole life, I've struggled with it. So is there anything that God is like really showing you or is it just kind of like understanding how loved you are? So then it's like that, that need is kind of like that goes away after you see how loved you are by him first. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great question. I think for me, um, I, I still, I don't really like praise from people in a sense, just like, I like to, um, you know, you all want, everybody wants to be liked, right? No one wants not to be liked and so forth. But I think for myself, the, what changed me was that verse, Colossians 3.23. I have to keep saying it all the time. Whatever I do, whether word or deed, do as if I'm doing for, me, uh, for the Lord, not man. Mm -hmm. Try cutting 30 kids a year. Try, try cutting and wrecking dreams of kids in high school. You talk about hard. I don't know how God has this guy who's a people pleaser having to do that. Um, it's not easy, right? And then I had to realize that, you know what? God's in control of their life. I'm going to love them. I'm going to tell them the right way. I'm going to share it with them. But I just trust that, you know, Lord, you got a better plan for them. You got something for them. You're going to use this. And so that's kind of what's helped me in some levels of it. But it's also that um, I have to really continue to repeat that verse for me um, when, I, when I'm in that situation. Thank you. Does that make sense? I don't know yeah. if that was helpful. Yeah, it is. It's, it's a hard one. I was, I was looking at my Bible, I was looking for verses, and something the Lord showed me as a recent is in, is in Galatians 1. It says, am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God, or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. And it's just super convicting because I feel yeah. like every day it's like you, know, you got to look this in the face. Like, am I doing it for people? Am I doing it for God? And I struggle with that every day. So you're not alone with that. That's good. I like that one a lot. Yeah, the word is good. You know, in a weird way, it's idolatry to try to get the approval of man in some level. It, it, you know, you're giving other people a place of authority to tell you who you are. And they shouldn't have that place of authority. You are, God is, you know, you're a child of God, right? And so often people want us to be something that we're not. And we want to be put in these things. And that's why I always say, be who God created you to be. Be who you're created to be. Don't try to be somebody else. And I think for me as a coach, that was a changer. I always felt like I had to be Tom Osborne, Christian guy, never complain to the ref once in your life. You know, um, I got the worst voice in the world. It sound, I sound like a whiner, man. I can't change it. It's just like, it's like a screech, you know, when I get mad and I'm intense, you know, but I'm not complaining to the officials, but I can't not be intense. And I coach hard and I'm ready to go. I'm not ripping guys, but like, 
I thought I had to change. And I, then once I got to the point, like, this is who I am. I don't have to apologize for who I am. I have to apologize if I step out of line and not honor God in the way I am. But this is who God made me to be. This is how he wants me to be. So that's what my challenge for all you guys. You don't have to be anything else but who you are. Don't try to be what somebody else wants you to be or wherever. Just use your gifts and God and understand and pursue God and all that in Christ and what you do and try to honor and glorify him and all that you are and all that you do, but within who God made you because he made you perfect, wonderful, special. You know, it's good to have that guy in that Bible study who's funny. Every now and then might overstep the line, but you need that, right? It's good to have that person in the Bible study who might cry 20 different times. It might drive you crazy, but that's important. You need that, right? It's important to have that everybody's different. Our thing, you know, thank God we don't have five thumbs. We only have one, you know, they're all different digits and they all serve a purpose. And God wants you to be you and he's going to use you in a mighty way just as who you are. Hey, BK, this is uh, Mike X. I want to just thank you for taking the time. I do have a question for you. And we you brought it up and I thought back in my own life of BK, when we're, when we start thinking about surrendering to God, but man, we're just scared out of our mind to surrender to God. Like, what do you say to God when you're just afraid to surrender either your sport or this dating relationship? You're, there's just a fear usually of thinking, if I surrender this, man, it might be taken away. And there's just fear there. So what would you say to a person if, that, if that's where they are? Well, that's a great question. Um, I just can tell you that you can trust him. Like, um, I know for me, when I'm in control, um, I, you know, I really don't, I, there's no peace, there's anxiety and, and everything else that comes in it and fear. And when I know I can surrender it to a God who loves me, and now that I know who he is and that you can trust, and I always tell people like, what do you have to lose? What do you have to lose in some levels of surrender? And you're trying to do it on your own and you're miserable, right? Um, and, you know, with control and surrender doesn't mean give up. That's the big difference, you know, like what, what uh, the great Dean Smith, you know, Winston Churchill said, never give up, never give up, never give up. And I heard Dean Smith once say, true power comes when you surrender, surrender, you know? And as I like, the one thing I say this too, as a coach, um, when I start thinking about an outcome, or as a player, when you start thinking about an outcome, for example, as a coach, if we don't win this game, we're not going to make the playoffs. So we got to win this game. Do you know how much anxiety and stress I have when I think about that? So I've learned to surrender the outcome of the game. And I tell our kids, we never talk about winning. We never talk about championships, ever, ever. I did, they all know their goals. But we say, focus on the process. What are you going to do today? And when you surrender your life to Christ, you're basically giving him the outcome. You're giving him your life. And you just need to focus on what you're going to do each and every day. And you don't have to think beyond that. You might have to think beyond that for your future goals and jobs and things like that, but just each and every day of where you are. And that's to me kind of how I surrender it is that, Lord, I'm giving you this. I trust you with the outcome. I'm laying it at your feet and I'm just going to continue to walk and try to pursue and love and honor you each and every day. And that's kind of like the well done, good, you know, faithful servant is just doing it that way. So um, it's the same thing from a sports psychology perspective, because um, it's the truth way of life. It's, it's the same beauty of sports. It marries it. Thanks, Bri. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Have a good Go night, Eels. everyone.